and as president of the Naga City Council for Women. She continued her inclusive service by becoming the representative of the 3rd District of Camarines Sur. As a congresswoman, she has authored many valuable bills, such as the People Empowerment Bill of 2014, the Freedom of Information Bill, the Full Disclosure Bill, Anti-Discrimination Bill of 2013, and the Agrarian Reform Commission Act, amongst other bills. Because of her exemplary service, she was given several recognitions, including the Freedom Flame Award by the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom Philippines in 2012, People Asia's 2014 Women of Style and Substance, the 2014 Udirang Ina Award for Tanyag na Udirang Ina, 2014 Rotary International District 3830 Peace Award, and the Inclusive Democracy Award given by the University of the Philippines National College of Public Administration and Governance. And now, to talk about attaining inclusive economic growth, let us welcome the newly appointed Secretary of the Housing and Urban Development Coordinating Council, the Vice President of the Philippines, Maria Leonor Morona Gabriel. When I was elected representative of the 3rd District of Camarines Sur in 2013, one of the first things that I did was visit the most remote barangays of my district. My district is composed of Naga City plus seven towns. There I discovered a wealth of information which were beyond me before. I saw children walking several kilometers each way to go to school on dirt roads that were extremely dusty during dry season and muddy during wet season. Some had to cross a broken hanging bridge suspended way above the ground over a deep rocky ravine. In one elementary school, I was very surprised to see in front of a classroom a manila paper that shows the schedule of which child can sit on Monday, on Wednesday, and so forth. It turned out there were 38 children, but only nine chairs available. Even more heartbreaking was the sight of extremely malnourished children in a town called Magarao where barangay health units had no salter weighing scales and height boards to measure them. So let me ask each one of you to imagine how each of you would feel if this were your children. Once when I was on my way to visit an IP community in Mount Isarol, I saw a group of people huddled together by the roadside at the foot of the mountain. Apparently, they were teachers and parents talking about how they will go about building their school when all they had were only eight posts. I saw them on a Thursday. The school year was to start next Monday. 
They said they were, they were waiting for the principal who was buying more materials from the town. The principal had to withdraw 10,000 pesos from her own savings account because the person who pledged the donation has not yet given the money. The 10,000 peso seed money bought them some pieces of coco lumber, nails, some bags of cement, and nipa shingles. I remember I had 12,000 pesos in my wallet and decided to give them the 10,000 to add to their little fund. When I got home, I posted about that experience on my Facebook account. And in a few days, we were able to raise 300,000 pesos for the school. With that small amount of money, they were able to build four classrooms made of combination of light materials and concrete, each one with a small comfort room. On several occasions, I spoke about the classroom with 38 students but only nine chairs in front of a Rotary Club and other groups. And even without asking for help, we got a deluge of our feeding programs. All this happened in very remote towns with very small population. Apparently, the local politicians did not bother to give them much thought. We do not think the people there buy much of your products or services. So the question now is, why should you care if their children go to school if, if they don't have a direct impact on your bottom line? The reason is this. Research has shown that building nations where everyone can live and thrive and enjoy the benefits of economic growth is the best way to create even more growth. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development said that in Mexico and New Zealand, rising inequality took away Italy in the United Kingdom and the United States. The cumulative growth rate would have been six to nine percentage points higher had income disparities not widened. On the other hand, greater equality helped increase GDP per capita in Spain, France, and Ireland prior to the Great Depression. In the Philippines, the richest 20% of the Philippine population received 52% of the country's total income in 1994, nearly 11 times the share received by the poorest, 20%. This was a marginally worse situation than in 1985. And I quote from a Forbes magazine article, indeed from 1957 till today, aside from brief periods of improvement, the country's Gini ratio has changed little consistently remaining the highest or one of the highest in Southeast Asia. In 2009, the poorest 20% of the population accounted for just 4.45% of national income. Close quote. Our country's best entrepreneurial minds are in this room. We hope these are not just numbers for you, because in reality, Inclusive growth is an issue that affects real people on the ground, like the principal and the parents who built a school with only eight posts to start with, 10,000 seed money, and just an indomitable desire to solve a pain painful problem in their community. They came together to address a clear and present need in their community. But with the donation of 300,000 pesos from outside their community, what was impossible became possible. Inclusive growth is not just critical for those in the fringes of society that we have vowed to serve, but also for your businesses to grow sustainably. Businesses and capital markets 
have been fueling global growth for decades, creating wealth for nations. But while market-led economic growth transform whole chunks of the global map. Its unfortunate byproduct was the exclusion of swaths of population who did not gain equality of economic opportunity. Faced with this trenchant problem, corporations around the world are reinventing capitalism and turning to disruption and innovation in the way they do business. While traditional businessmen want to keep wealth circulating within a small, closed group, a new crop of businessmen now know that as more people break the cycle of poverty, more people can afford to buy their products and services. They know that when business is done as usual, the income, income gap widens. That is why they are embracing business unusual. How? Profit is now no longer the sole driver of growth. Shared value is. This way, growth does not have to slowly trickle down to the poor. As the private sector redefines products and pricing models to turn the swaths of population that have been left out as their new target market, shared value is created. Growth and progress happen at the same time. We need growth for all, not just for a select few. Progress that benefits only the elite is no progress at all. There are issues in this conversation that may ruffle some of our feathers. We might have to break monopolies correct poor labor practices, reassess our tax system, among other things. I also personally believe that there is value in considering the continuation and expansion of the current social protection system through our Pantawid Familia Filipino program and our field health. We may also have to think about incentivizing the adoption of a more inclusive value chain model that will create more rural jobs and livelihood. This should facilitate increased productivity in agriculture without compromising our competitiveness as we strive to grow our domestic and export market share. Linked to all this, I also cannot overemphasize the importance of creating a better and more efficient business environment. Removing inefficiencies in doing business enhances the growth of both big and small corporations. We in government must also continue to find better ways to enable our micro, small to medium scale enterprises to be more integral players in growing our economy. More than 99% of our companies in the country are small, and they employ 64.97% of our people. As we support small players and social entrepreneurs, we, build, we bridge progress to the excluded bottom. Gun is business as usual. Let us now embrace business unusual. Celebrate disruption and innovation and create wealth and profit shared by both top and bottom. The Office of the Vice President is committed to help in changing the face of poverty in the next six years. We want to focus on five areas, hunger and food security, universal health care, rural development, education, and people empowerment. The President has recently offered us a cabinet position as Housing Secretary. And as you know, we have gratefully accepted. Housing is also one of the things that my husband, Jesse, used to work on when he was still Mayor of Naga City and when he became Interior Secretary. Before he passed away almost four years ago, 
Jesse was working on innovations that would allow the government to build cheap, climate change resilient, in-city, on-site on housing developments for the urban poor. We will not be working from scratch in this portfolio. We will be hitting the ground running. We want to address the 1.4 million housing backlog within our term. We will disrupt and we will innovate. We will enjoin the private sector to be our partners in providing not just houses, but decent and affordable communities where our people will find jobs where our children can safely go to school, attend church, run around and play safely. We are not asking for your charity. Companies like Finma Properties have proven that these developments can be also commercially viable, as shown by their on-site resettlement investments in Quezon City. In the past, Informal settler families would pay anywhere from 1,500 pesos to 3,500 pesos per month to dwell in a 10 square meter space with no proper sewage and drainage system. Through FINMA's partnership with the Quezon City government, Pag-ibig Fund and several partner NGOs, ISFs today, shell out only a little more than 2,000 pesos as monthly amortization through Pag-ibi for decent 26 square meter homes and with loft provisions that have proper sewerage and drainage and security of tenure. Inclusive growth needs inclusive business and that means corporations address a social need in a commercially viable way. This is just one example of addressing the 1% problem that perpetuates the current instability of our nation's social order, where the poor continue to be poor and get left behind. I am positive you can think of more ways to help. There are so many things that we can do, but so little time. More important than what is how we will do them. Collaboration and consultation would be key. With you, the private sector, who brings so much of your resources, your commitment, your expertise, your efficiency, and your networks to the table, and the, with the beneficiaries themselves. Over the co course of our work as an alternative lawyer, lawyer working with the marginalized, we have discovered that the best solutions come from those who have lived in poverty themselves. They know better than highly paid consultants or are equally knowledgeable about what is good for their food. For instance, when informal settlers are included at the table at the very start of planning their communities, these projects tend to be more successful. It is true. Consultations take time, and trust issues need to be addressed. But when the poor are given a seat at the table and their voices are heard, that is when miracles happen. Imagine what we can achieve in six years. The idea of the unlimited ways to do good fuels my passion and gives me energy, even as I try to get used to in interesting changes that come with my new job. For both of us, the government and the private sector, we need to embrace this disruption from within, or else we risk being at the mercy of global developments. This elusive, inclusive growth can only happen if we ourselves make it part of our personal inner scorecard. The fact that you are here indicates that you are willing for us to work together. Like the parents and the principal huddled together to build that small school. Working together has a way of igniting passion even from those who may be sitting on a fence. That urge to collaborate and build bridges of understanding is our single 
most important resource. The imperative to harness our diverse gifts and unique roles in society towards concrete platforms of collective action can no longer be ignored. Let our driving force for this be the inclusion and the transformation of the lives of the majority of our people who have long been excluded from the benefits of the wealth that has been created. Personally, I am filled with gratitude and enriched whenever I am given the opportunity to be an instrument in changing lives for the better, especially for those who have less. I believe it will not be different for you. We will be knocking on your doors, the doors of your boardrooms, and we hope you welcome us. Thank you very much. Thank you all for listening. Magandang umaga po muli. Identify for themselves what project they could get a social media that could also be commercially viable. Two things I can say. One of that is, um, even People are not really given uh, enough voice in, in, in the planning process. Most of the programs are just uh, given to them um, with the very best of intentions, of course. Um, the, the donors and the sponsors who did this are the, um, this will fulfill the, the greatest need of the people. But from experience, it would be better to give them a seat at the table from the planning process, not later in the day. Because if they are they are allowed to to, to um, air air their voices and allowed to plan with the sponsors, the projects become very very successful. And, and one of this is the problem with housing. When when my husband was still secretary of, of DILT, um, they conceptualized a program called People's Plan. Um, the relocation of renovation of informal centers are done through a People's Plan where people themselves um, plan everything, where they will renovate, uh, talk, talk with landowners, um, do everything by themselves, and just just to make them feel that government is there whatever their plans are. This were the most successful renovations. One, one question that everybody's mind is going to say, how do we help you uh, in housing? Uh, and what are your plans to hold uh, what are these consultations that brings everybody to the same table? What are the needed plans and what ideas might be for You know, I, I mentioned in my speech that we have identified five for programs already. Um, hunger, food security, education, rural development, empowerment, and universal health care. This was conceptualized um, with the thought that I won't be given any cabinet posts. So we started to get the ground running already, right after, even before my inauguration on June 30. Um, what we're doing now is, you know, um, the only power that the Vice President has, or the only role that the Vice President is given um, under the Constitution is just to be there, just in case something happens to the President. Uh, we, we had studied what the previous administrations did, at least the Office of the Vice President did. And most of the things that they did were more ceremonial and political. There wasn't much space for us to do an advocacy work. So when, when we started um, analyzing the budget, when we started analyzing what's there for us, there wasn't enough elbow room for us to do policy and advocacy work. And we wanted to change it. Um, we, we, we started um, asking PBM to allow us to give more, more, more space for advocacy work. And that's what we're doing now. Um, the reason why we transferred office was we wanted to save more money. Right now, we would be saving like, at least 200,000 won. That will give us more space to do what we want to do. But since we don't have any mandate to Executive programs. What we intend to be doing is to act as a convener of sorts. There are so many groups out there doing advocacy work, so many private civil society groups, NGOs doing CSR related work, but there's no, no umbrella program for all of them to be doing this. So, what we're doing now is we're holding a lot of advocacy meetings. 
getting all these groups together. We're doing now a sort of an environment um, scanning. Um, who, which groups are doing um, advocacy work for hunger and food security? We will not them in one group. Which groups are doing uh, education-related CSR? Everyone who may streamline. Streamline all that they're, they're doing. Para walang doble, walang, walang. Um, we will provide a forum for all these groups to talk together and discuss what could I do, what could the other groups do, and be able to do it for all of us. Speaking of environment, I scan and crowdsources for ideas for opportunities. Um, what about the development experts and people who want to do this is for the growth of one of the development and venue. Growth that, to address the housing backlog, housing should be addressed uh, not as a noun, rather as a verb. In other words, he was saying that ownership is good, but we should throw to the mix affordable housing made of it, uh, affordable by rent, uh, and so on, as being done in Germany in a lot of uh, first world countries where ownership is not necessary. Right? Does this resonate with you and might this open up some ideas where other models for housing might be uh, participating in the private sector? You know, um, I, I was appointed Friday. I was appointed Friday. Uh, I was in the now when the president told me uh, uh, When I reached Manila, I had to, uh, I had to summon some of the officials of Hansi to get me keeping a living. And I was, I was quite surprised by the numbers given to me. Um, I, I, I mentioned in my speech that there, there's a 1.4 million backlog of houses. But they, they were saying that's not the real number. It might balloon to 5. Point, I think 5.5 million. If we will be able to have an honest to goodness inventory of all who, who do not have these houses. But you know, the, the, the bulk of the pro problem is in Metro Manila. And in Metro Manila, there are not so, so many um, lands left anymore for these houses. So we're looking at the model uh, demonstrated by Singapore and Hong Kong to be able to combat this problem. Meaning, um, set our sights on um, medium to high-rise uh, housing projects instead of, instead of um, uh, uh, vertical uh, housing. Um, there has to be a, a amendment to many policies that are there already. Um, HATC is not exactly a department of housing. It's just a coordinating council of six other key shelter agencies. So, um, strictly speaking, it doesn't have much much power. And all the key shelter agencies are, are uh, working on their own. Um, we, we have a lot of um, cleaning up and uh, shaking up of policies uh, so that we will become more effective. But the, the main thrust really is to do away with the bank uh, at, least, at least in the next six years. We hope to be able to do that. I, I would like to think that this administration is fully supportive of that. Uh, the, the past administration has done a lot of already, but because of the backlogs that are there, um, we really have to work uh, to bend over and work backwards so, so as to erase everything. We understand the Vice President has to be on her way to her next appointment, Vice President Ruben. Maraming salamat. Maraming salamat. Thank you for having us. When I was elected representative of the 3rd District of Camarines Sur in 2013, one of the first things that I did was visit the most remote barangays of my district. My name award by the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom Philippines in 2012. 
People Asia's 2014 Women of Style and Substance. The 2014 Unirang Ina Award for Tanyag na Unirang Ina. 2014 Rotary International District 3830 Peace Award. And the Inclusive Democracy Award given by the University of the Philippines National College of Public Administration and Governance. And now, to talk about attaining inclusive economic growth, the district is composed of Laga City plus seven towns. There, I discovered a wealth of information which were beyond me before. I saw children walking several kilometers each way to go to school on dirt roads that were extremely dusty during dry season and muddy during wet season. Some had to cross a broken hanging bridge suspended way above the ground over a deep rocky ravine. In one elementary school, I was very surprised to see in front of a classroom a Manila. Let us welcome the newly appointed Secretary of the Housing and Urban Development Coordinating Council, the Vice President of the Philippines, Maria Leonor Verona Gabriel. by becoming the representative of the 3rd District of Camarines Sur. As a congresswoman, she has authored many valuable bills, such as the People Empowerment Bill of 2014, the Freedom of Information Bill, the Full Disclosure Bill, Anti-Discrimination Bill of 2013, and the Agrarian Reform Commission Act, amongst other bills. Because of her exemplary service, she was given several recognitions, including the Freedom 